President of Bloody Fat. Good morning. The first guest today will be Chris Leftery. And of course, he got the principle of environmentally friendly design. If you don't know, Chris Leftery is a very well known designer due to his work with materials and their application on design. He's studio and his publications has been essential to change the way in which designers and the industry understand materials. And amongst his books, we should stress materials for design and another six books of the materials for inspirational design series. This had led a change in the way in which designers see and use materials. Chris Leftery Design has locations in London and Seoul and works with multiple Fortune 100 companies and major design studios, implementing a broad range of strategies for effective materials integration in the design process. The studio has a unique expertise that germinates new approaches in automotive, packaging, sports, furniture, and consumer electronics. The studio also works with major material suppliers, helping them to communicate more effectively with the design industry and find new markets. So without further ado, Chris, please tienes la palabra. Thank you, Salvi, for the introduction. Thank you, Fad, for inviting me to this fantastic city of Barcelona and uh, inspiring design that I've been very conscious of since I was a student studying product design in London. So, uh, what do you want to be, Brick? Uh, we talked about Dieter Rams, and we talked about his principles of good design, uh, but this is a quote from uh, another designer. This is a quote from, actually, an architect, Louis Kahn, and what I like about this quote, which is something that he used to tell his students when they were looking for inspiration or they were stuck in their in their design, is that what it does is it asks the question of the material. What do you want to be brick? And my starting point is materials. So the starting point is to put materials first. And actually to think about materials as one of the key principles of, uh, of good design. And what I want to think about, what I want you to think about today, what I'll present is actually when we consider materials, we need to consider what good means in terms of a material. Because there are very few bad materials, there are some, but there are few bad materials. There are much, much more use, bad uses of materials. And this is what I want to explore. What is a good material? And actually, what is a material that is appropriate? Um, and how materials can be the starting point for good design? So things have moved a long way from Lewis Carlin's quote, what do you want to be, Brick? Uh, and maybe we need to ask a slightly different question, which is, uh, where do you want to be, Brick? And I'll explain what I mean as I go through the talk. So materials are stories. Materials carry stories in products, in buildings, and in furniture, and in cars. And you only have to look at YouTube, and you have to look at blogs to understand how important the story of a material is in contributing to the value of a, of a design. And I'm going to tell this story in three parts. The first part of my story is going to be the narrator. So I am the narrator. Who am I? So as Salvi mentioned, uh, I'm a writer of materials. These are some of my books, uh, I think, are available in Spanish. And the starting point for my exploration of materials, coming from an industrial design background, was actually to look at how you can tell a story about materials that is relevant for design. Not for engineers, but for design. And the philosophy of the studio is based around these three industrial areas. The area of color materials and finishes, which is trends. The area of materials and material suppliers. And the area of industrial design. And what we do is put these three things together to make connections for our clients. And the starting point is, looks something like this, which you might see here uh, in the FAD material collection, which is material samples. And 
we tell stories. We might tell a story of a particular group of materials for one user, which might be about real materials, about metals, leathers. We might have a story which is much more of a Generation Z story for consumers. Or we might tell a story which is for something else. And what we do is we take these materials as a starting point and we start to generate designs. And we might, in this particular case, generate a design for a car seat. Um, and we work with many different types of clients. As Salvi mentioned at the beginning in my introduction, we work with car companies, we work with consumer electronics companies, we work with appliance companies, some sports brands, and we put materials at the start of this process. And then last year, I launched a, my own material, uh, which was called Fix It. And this is my story about materials, which is actually taking plastics and trying to bring something positive out of a material that can be used to repair, fix, play, that is uh, biodegradable. And this is the first time that I started to explore how I can develop my own material. But the starting point is to ask this question, how do you want, what do you want to be brick? And to actually stretch what this question means. Because my starting point when I started the books was to look at engineering. This tells one story. You could look at this data sheet, uh, and this would tell you what the brick, or in this case, I think it's something else, ceramic, might want to be. Um, but we need to ask ourselves a different question when we think about materials. We need to ask ourselves, how do you want to feel brick? for example. This is uh, some research that um, one of my designers, Guy Gripper, who, um, who works for me in London, did when she was studying. She studied in Milan at Politecnico, and what she wanted to understand was how people perceive the value of a product. Uh, what are the key attributes of the, uh, of the material that are important? And you can see that the biggest area that people perceive the value of a product is sensoriality. So how it feels, the weight, the hardness, the coldness, the sound, all of these things contributing to how we perceive the quality of a product. So when we, need, when we think about materials, we need to think about how materials make us feel. And when we think about good materials, or the application of good materials in the studio, um, we need to think about the experiences and the stories that they build. And we follow this kind of pyramid with the story at the top, because like I said, materials build stories. Um, and these stories come from experiences. And the experience of a material derives from three things. It derives from its functionality. It derives from the emotional uh, content that it can generate. And it derives from sensoriality. So when we start to break down materials, we think about these three things. And what do I mean by these three things? So here's a great example of a materials-led product. This is the Adidas Boost. And the material um, that you see on the sole of this shoe is um, a material that came from uh, farming. And it actually came from uh, a, as a material for milking cows. Because cows produce more milk when they're comfortable. And so if you can make a soft surface for a cow, uh, then it will be more productive. And you can clean it very easily with this material, and you can wash it down. It's hygienic. Um, but some guys at Adidas discovered this material and thought that it would be great because it has very good bounce properties uh, for a running shoe. So the functional story of this material is that this material makes you go faster. Okay. It's a very interesting, unique pattern, which is very, I think, now much part of Adidas's DNA, color materials DNA. But actually, the functional benefit is that it makes you go faster. So here we have a material that makes you go faster. If we think about sensoriality, um, we only have to look at products like this. Um, and products like this, in terms of materials, this was perhaps the first time that we saw an alternative to plastics in a portable electronic device. What's very interesting about this product is that it was the first time that we had a material that was unconventional. So not plastic, but actually stainless steel. 
not just stainless steel, but polished, mirror-polished stainless steel, which is quite hard to achieve in production. You have to do a lot of work to make the surface like a mirror. Why is this to do with um, sensoriality? Because it contradicts, as does every phone that came from this product, is that it contradicts what we expect of a, of a, of a portable device. And it opened the door for us to consider materials not just like stainless steel, but materials like glass. And actually to change the way that we perceive these products. And to change the way that through the hardness, through the coldness, through the fact that it's using a real material, that we perceive quality. And that we are willing to sacrifice function for quality. And this sensorial, quality, sensorial story is really because it's hard, it's cold, it's authentic. Um, and something that maybe unconsciously all consumers value, which is why we're happy to walk around with a phone made out of glass. If we think about the last one, which is emotional, materials can make us feel certain things. Uh, my wallet, which maybe I've had in my back pocket for 10 years, starts to conform to the shape of my, of my body, uh, and it makes me feel attached to it. Um, I could have the same in an armchair, something that grows with me. But actually, well, I've chosen this example because if you ask me my favorite material, there are never really favorite materials, as I said. It's never the good material or the bad material. It's actually the good use of a material. And in terms of a story, this is a great story because um, before this product was released, no one had thought about making a, a dust container made out of a transparent material because no one could imagine that you would ever want to see the dirt that's in your room, in your home. But what I really like about this application of transparent polycarbonate is that it makes you feel like you have done something good because the dirt that is on your floor is now in this plastic container. And that sense of achievement is something that comes from the fact that it is a transparent plastic. So, in this case, the story of um, emotional rewards is because we feel like we've had a sense of achievement. So these are th my three principles of the application of materials to tell a story. Um, and one other key principle that we follow in the studio is this, that if you look at the typical uh, design process, um, when we started to separate <clears throat> the manufacturing of products from the maker in the Industrial Revolution, and you had machines making, and you have the designer in a different place. You had this separation of materials and knowledge of materials to the, from the designer. And so we typically start now with the issue or the design problem, then we design the product, and then we think about the materials, and then it goes into production. What we do is that we put materials before the design, because if you put materials before the design, the opportunities for, uh, for creativity, for implementation, and actually something quite unique is much stronger. Um, we can also take that a step further back and say that we're going to start with materials because the materials may create solutions to problems that you didn't even know existed. So this principle of materials-centric design, where materials come first, is really important to us in the studio. But now we have to think about something more important. And this quote from Stella McCartney says it all. She says, the starting point is not design, the starting point is sustainability. Um, and so here we have to start thinking about other options as well. And chapter two. So chapter two is the story. So I told you about myself and my philosophy about materials and design. Um, we have to think about uh, the stories that are increasingly, um, very rapidly, I should say, over a period of months, maybe six months, in terms of the types of projects that I'm asked to address in the last six months, the subjects of sustainability has done this as a curve. Very surprising that it should be so rapid in such a short space of time, because it's not a new issue. But what I like about Stella McCartney's work is that she starts from sustainability. She has a philosophy to remove PVC, any PVC from her products, to remove any natural leather, to, sorry, any 
natural cotton to remove leather from her products, and to develop um, fashion, or in this case, shoes, that are really focused on as many attributes of a sustainability as possible. So with the Louvre shoe, let me show you the video. Um, She's looking at the disassembly of a shoe and this, um, making all the components of that shoe come apart or to be produced without the use of glue. We talk about plastics being a particularly bad material for the environment. No one ever considers that glue is even worse because glue contributes to a whole set of other problems. What she's looking at here is glue. Um, sorry, is the removal of glue from the product. Um, but we can look at other interesting scenarios. Um, I picked Stella McCartney because she's dealing with luxury. Her story is not to do with um, you should feel guilt guilty about the environment. Her story is that you should feel very positive about the environment. She says that you should buy one t-shirt that is a good t-shirt because that one good t-shirt means you don't have to buy 50 cheap t-shirts. So that's how she justifies the idea of cost as well. Um, this is the interior for the Tesla. This is, I think, the Model X. Um, Tesla now don't produce uh, or don't offer the option of leather for their seats. They only offer the option of vegan leather. Um, what the word vegan means, I'm not quite sure, but uh, it started out that vegan leather was an expensive option. Right? So it becomes more expensive than leather, which is kind of the reverse of how most other car companies um, operate and sell. Materials now they only produce leather. Um, this is a chair from IKEA, who uh, were looking at reusing vegetable oils from cooking uh, to formulate a new type of polypropylene. And then this is another project from IKEA and Tom Dixon, using a recycled aluminium, uh, post-consumer recycled aluminium from a, a Scandinavian company called Hydro. So these stories, and this one, which you're probably most familiar with, which is, again, the Adidas um, uh, Pale shoe, uh, which takes recycled waste from the ocean and uses it for their shoes. So these are the stories that are contributing to our uh, consumer life, and more and more they are to do with sustainability. But what we, if we start to dig a little bit deeper, these are great case studies, and they are great stories, and actually, if I explain my theory about these kinds of projects, it is that they raise awareness. The contribution that they make to the environment may not be significant because out of the uh, 403 million shoes that Adidas produce every year, only one million come from this particular project. So one million uh, out of 400 million shoes per year is to do with is this sustainable project. So the impact is not huge at the moment. What's more important is that this story influences us. Uh, but if we think about this diagram and the value of materials in terms of a story, we need to think about the additional thing, because this builds experiences. But we need to think about the principles of good materials. And if you just take plastics as an example, um, and you look at this diagram. If you look at the red circle, it's the bad stuff. It comes from fossil fuels. Um, it is not recyclable, because not all plastics are recyclable, because either they uh, cannot be recycled or there is no recycling stream for them. If you look at the uh, top left one, which is the green one, um, this is the better materials. These are materials that are bio-based and they are compostable. Compostable is, best, is the best. Compostable is better than biodegradable. Compostable brings something back into the earth. So we have these two uh, kind of polar opposites. But if you look at the consumption of these materials in industrial production, uh, Oh, I'm 
grapes, sorry, I'm missing a, some data. If you look at the production, the consumption of these materials, the one in the green occupies something like 98% of global production of plastics. Sorry, the one in the red. The one in the green is something like 0.1%. So we have a long way to go before we can start having a big impact and putting a dent in these kinds of materials. Um, uh, you can see here, 0.2% is the bio-based compostable versus 98% of the fossil-based uh, non-recyclable. So you might then quite think, well, if I want to be good and I want to manufacture, let's say, disposable pens or you know, uh, consumer products made out of plastic, then I need to go for the green. But this is not always the solution because natural materials are not always going to give us the best. If we look at cotton, for example, cotton is a material that is bio-based. It biodegrades in five to six months, um, but it is one of the worst polluters, or it is responsible for one of the worst kind of environmental impacts across um, any uh, organic material through pesticides, through the use of water, uh, through the use, uh, toxins uh, from that, those pesticides um, going into the ground. So we have this issue. It's not just about new. It's not just about uh, bio-based materials and uh, degradable materials. It's about something else. If we look at this diagram, which is connected to uh, cotton and, uh, and the use of garments, we have to start thinking about the issue of time, because there is an appropriateness or good use of materials for certain things that are based on long-term versus those materials that are very short-term. I found this diagram which relates to our, the, the trends in how we buy clothes. And it goes from 2000 to 2015. And over that period of time, the, um, uh, the sales of, of garments, fashion, has grown from 50 billion to 100 billion over that five-year period of time. That's the black line, that's the purple line, growth in sales. If you look at the green line, this represents how many times we're actually wearing these clothes. So we're buying more clothes, we're buying more T-shirts, but we're wearing them less often. And you can see this decline is on a curve downwards. What we want is the reverse of this. We want to be using things for longer. Um, this is another story, this is from H&M. Um, who, if you go to an H&M store, uh, they have these bins where you can recycle your clothes. And there's a journalist, Lucy Siegel, uh, she wrote a piece for The Guardian when she wrote a book on sustainability and fashion. And she identified that um, based on this goodwill of H&M, um, uh, of collecting garments, that it would take H&M it will H&M sell within 48 hours um, uh, 1,000, sorry, let me start again. <laughs> I'm getting confused with my numbers. Uh, it would take H&M 12 years to recycle the garments that they sell in 48 hours. Right, 12 years to recycle the garments they sell in, 12, in, 12, uh, in two days. So we have to think about time, and we have to think about appropriate uses of materials in time. We have now a big shift away from plastic in, in carrier bags. The, the most significant impact of this is not that we're saving on plastic. Yes, we are saving on plastic. Yes, we're saving on the waste of plastic. The most significant impact is that, I don't know if it's the same in Spain, but every time I go into a supermarket in the UK, I have to ask if I want a suit, if I want a plastic bag, or I'm asked if I want a supermarket, if I want a plastic bag. It is that moment of considering the environment that is more powerful than actually the piece of plastic that I'm taking. But going back to this equation and the use of appropriateness of materials over time, um, we could say that tote bags are um, con tote bags are better for the environment than a plastic bag. But I worked out that if you were to use a tote bag twice a day, um, it would take you 10 years to have made the same uh, environment impact as just using one plastic bag. So we have this issue now of uh, time versus use of materials. And this is something that we need to also consider. Um, so my last chapter, 
the players. The players are the materials. What are the materials that we can uh, bring, and what are the new materials that we can bring to this story? And when we consider new, it's very difficult to just think about new as in new technologies. We have to think about new in terms of three different contexts. And the three different contexts are that we can think about new, uh, using existing materials in a new way, we can use existing materials in a new place, or we can use new materials in a new place. New materials means totally new. Um, but if we start with the first one and we look at what this can mean using new materials, sorry, existing materials in new ways, we have to go back to this idea that I said before, which is that we need to consider the appropriateness of materials over duration of time. The biggest use of plastics currently is in uh, packaging. And what this diagram shows is that if you look at the bottom section, I don't know if you can read it, if you look at the bottom section, you can see something like 300 million tons of plastic is used in, in packaging currently. If you look at the top section, this is to do with building and construction, where we have a much longer span of use of plastic, i.e. plastic stays in the buildings for years as opposed to months at the bottom. Uh, but we can see the biggest proportion of use of plastic is in the, in the application that lasts the least amount of time. So there are some solutions that look at what this, how we can uh, have impact in this. This is a solution from not a material, but from a production. This is a process developed by a German company is, uh, called Mucel, and it in, impregnates plastic with tiny bubbles. And if you impregnate bubbles into materials, then the air is doing some of the work in the structure, and you remove the amount of plastic. So you can reduce the amount of plastic by having something like 15% less, less of it in a product like this. Um, we can also look at different types of constructions. This is um, Peter Donder, who did a great series of experiments taking the industrial process of filament winding, which is used in aerospace, and applying that into um, lightweight furniture. So you just have the minimal construction that you need in order to fulfill a function. Well, this, which is the Future Graph Adidas Future Craft Loop again, um, which is a shoe that is made from only one material. So it can be completely recycled. It's a, material, it's a shoe that uses uh, different grades of the one material, TPU, uh, but the same type of material. So the whole shoe can be shredded in one process and recycled. There's no separation. And like I said before, if we can remove glue, then we can maybe have something more of an impact. Yeah. This is yeah. um, a project from MIT uh, where they look at uh, different ways of assembling products, assembling products. It's called, uh, it's, it's, uh, Scarlett Tibbetts is the leader of this group. And this was a, an experiment that he did looking at different ways of assembling something. Um, if we move to the next category, uh, existing materials in new places. So how can we reuse materials in new places? And if you look at the work that is coming out of universities and art colleges around the world, it is increasingly about the function of materials and developing materials from waste. Um, and if we think about this diagram of use of plastic over time and thinking about particular plastics that only need to last for, last for moments or minutes, this is... Um, uh, a project, from, it's quite an old project, Emiliano Godoy, a Mexican designer, who uses uh, crystallized sugar uh, to replace these um, uh, ceramic pieces that people use for shooting. Uh, so normally they would make it a ceramic and you shoot it and then it falls on the land and it just sits there, nothing happens to it. Whereas if you make it out of sugar, it will just dissolve. It has the durability that is needed for the very short lifespan that it needs. Uh, another project which is from Packaging Machine, sorry, Tomorrow Machine, who I'm not sure if they still exist, but they did a whole series of really interesting experiments using different materials for packaging. This is using crystallized sugar again as a container for oil. So a product that has no need for it to be an extended lifespan because we can buy it and we can you know, uh, empty its contents and then we can uh, discard it without any waste. Or well, this one, which is uh, now, he was the first guy who did this. This is Alkesh uh, Palmer from uh, the Royal College, maybe four years ago, five years ago. They looked at how you can use orange skin 
to mix with the bioresin and create an injection moldable uh, material. It's based on something like 19 million tons of oranges get produced um, uh, every year in one particular place uh, and using the waste from that juice industry to produce plastic. Um, all this, which is mycelium, which maybe some of you know, this is using mushrooms uh, to grow products. Uh, they have now started to uh, extend their material from just foam into um, an elastomer that you can use in footwear to replace um, plastic soles. Uh, it grows in four to five days, and then it's completely compostable. So, I, you know, an ideal material for a product that has maybe a short lifespan. And then the last one is, as I said before, developing completely new materials and using them in new ways. Um, and this is um, a project that looks at taking uh, carbon monoxide from the air, so the exhaust fumes of cars, and turning that into an ink that can be printed. Uh, it was developed by Graphiki, Graphiki la uh, Labs um, and makes use by taking the pollution out of the environment and turning it into a and ink. Or this, which is a plastic that comes from an industry that produces six and a half million units of waste every single day from one company alone in North America. And it is chickens for food. And the waste is the feathers. And there are researchers in Australia at um, a textile research institute. Um, that have looked at how you can extract the proteins from the feathers and turn that into a, a plastic. And then the last one, which is this one. So when we talk about materials and appropriateness of use and uh, good materials, this is one of the most interesting ones that I could think of. This is a water bottle that is uh, generated from seaweed. Uh, seaweed grows one meter per day, roughly. Uh, they can reuse that seaweed uh, as a skin for a bottle, and it composts in a matter of four to six weeks. So we don't have plastic at all. We have something that doesn't con uh, conflict with the food chain in a fantastic product. So if I finish up uh, principles of good design from Dieter Rams, I'd like to add this one, which is good design follows good materials, which is the main point of my talk. But if I add one more, to the quote of Lewis Kahn, it wouldn't be, what do you want to be, Brick? It would be, where do you want to be, Brick? Thank you very much.